your back before the cargo container. Its draw has not lessened since you were last here. If anything, it seems to have grown slightly. For the cargo container. Its drawer has and as it's always been. It's impossible to open a container with rhetoric. Maybe you're losing your mind. Mister, I nearly be back to talk with old Leo here. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. It's like Lady Larice said when she opened a bathhouse in the basement of my apartment building. They can only get so far before they're aching to get back. And lots of folk really did keep coming back. No trouble at all, mister. No trouble at all. It's like that old saying goes, wisdom withers if not shared. And old Leo is always up for sharing. Oh, that one. That should be empty as far as I know. Lots of containers here have nothing in them. They're just waiting to be loaded up. Told you. Oh, I'm just making some covers for them containers here. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. So it's easier for the crane operators to spot them. Sure, mister. About what? Oh. Most of the guys are down at the gates, keeping the scabs from coming in. We're on a strike. The whole union is. You don't have to work when you're on strike. Ha! We haven't worked for two months now. So no one is working? <laughs> Not everyone is down there, of course. Mr. Everard is in his office, where he always is. And Jean-Luc is guarding the gate. But Titus and his boys got into some drunken trouble and Everard sent them on a nice vacation for a week or so. Oh, I'm not really supposed to talk about that. That's union business. Him and his boys stirred up something in town, probably drank too much and got into a fight or something. I heard Mr. Everard telling them to take some time off. I guess the boys got a bit too rowdy and had to let out some steam. I don't really know the details, that's just how boys are, you know. <laughs> I haven't been in a fight since I was in middle school. Easy, Leo. Let's keep this on the hardies. Look at him. It's not going to be anything useful anyway. Don't fight it. Better to go with the flow. I remember I was the runt of the class. <laughs> The bigger boys always used to pick on me. You see, I had a bit of a temper back in the day. Flew off the handle like nobody's business. But Mr. Everett and his brother always came to help. Once they beat old Noel Becker so bad he needed stitches on his head. <laughs> Noel never started another fight with anyone after this. Mr. Everett and Mr. Edgar are real nice guys, mister. You should go talk to Mr. Everett. I'm sure you'll be good friends. He's friends with everyone around here. <coughs> oh, hey, mister. I need no trouble at all, mister. No, oh, that one. Told you. Oh, yes, yes. I leave all. Of course, mister. Oh, I'm just making some covers for them containers here. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. So it's easier for the crane operators to spot them. The containers in the yard are green in Wild Pines livery, and the mountains rising behind Leo is all red in Union colors. It's like some red infection was spreading outwards from the container yard's core. There appear to be cisterns underneath the Union container covers. Yes, they are hiding it from the inside. 
All the red containers have the Debarders Union logo on them. No, not really. Miss Everett doesn't tell me all the big things. Says I go and tell them to everyone. Oh, I don't know, mister. They say it's some chemicals. Most of them have labels on them, I think. Oh, no trouble at all, mister. No trouble at all. Mr. Dubois, every worker. That's right, Mr. Dubois. I see the socialist democratic fervor now bands in your heart, too. How can I help you today? I don't know what that means, Harry, but I love it. <laughs> I love your initiative. Knowing you're out there keeping things running lets me focus on the big picture stuff. Don't even tell me what was going on. Alcoholic brew, stronger, stopped it, strike. I'm just going to let you surprise me, Harry. I'm very glad to hear that, Harry. One question. You didn't actually happen to stumble in and see what's inside the apartment, did you? He's trying to figure out if you're lying. Exactly the kind of fascist memorabilia I was expecting. Weasel probably prays to it every night for the downfall of the Union. He was testing you, and you succeeded. Now let's get down to brass tacks. It's time for men like me and you to figure out who's killed who and why. Real police work is going to start happening now. I promise you, Harry, this is going to be good. By now, I'm sure you've figured out who the dead man was working for. The bad guys. Wild pines. Sent to scare us. Another violent measure of the top hats against us flat caps. Harry, this strike is the culmination of many, many mistakes made by the Wild Pines group. They tried to shut the strike down by sending in armed mercenaries. You mean our victim? A security contractor? Can you imagine that? Workers standing in peaceful protest, united in the spirit of fellowship, and they send hired killers to mow us down with machine gun fire. He performs a motion as if spraying bullets from a machine gun. I'm talking beasts, hardened killers from proxy wars in Yisut, Seminine, Sadamaritsa, you name it, they've done it. Raping, killing, burning villages, Killing little children for the Senores of Pineapple Company, Harry. Everything they did there, they brought over here. They want to turn Revachol into a third world slum. Honestly, the only thing they didn't do is kill the village elephant. No, Harry, the elephant is metaphorical and so is the village. But the mercs and their brutality are very real. Now, I haven't personally witnessed the brutalities out there. I have the luxury of staying in my container, you see. If I need to go somewhere, they just move my container. Yes, I'm an old man, Harry. My legs aren't what they used to be. They lift my office with that big crane. It's actually very fun. You should try it. But enough about me and my fun container. The killers the company hired, I think there were three of them, all hardened commando types. One of them got downright suicidal, getting drunk, violent, a little rapey. Even their own negotiator couldn't control him. 
That's your boy, the one who likes hanging out and trees. What makes you think the Wild Pines negotiator can't control them? Harry, what you need to realize is, we dock workers are not pushovers. We got grit, Harry. This whole neighborhood does. Push us hard enough and we push back. And when we do, we push to kill. There's a militant wing inside the Union, a group of people whose duties don't involve manual labor, but peacekeeping in the neighborhood, making sure everything runs smoothly. That sounds a bit like organized crime. They're like you guys. Idealistic people who want to make sure bad things don't happen. And if they already have, well, punishment must follow. Again, that sounds like organized crime. So these idealists killed our victim? Hmm. One day Titus Hardy, leader of this peacekeeping faction, comes up to me and says, Boss, socialist democratic fervor drove us to take it upon ourselves to kill this beast that was burdening the land. He probably worded it differently, but that was the idea. Sure sounded to me like they killed him. <laughs> I gave them two weeks paid leave and told them to lay low to avoid retaliation. Aren't you worried we might arrest them for this? Oh, I'm not at all worried about that. These are not the kind of men who get arrested. They're Martin A's boys, tough and gritty. I'd like to see the man who takes them in. Besides, I sent my lawyer girl to look after them. He places a lot of faith in that lawyer girl. Perhaps this is a tactical error? Anyway. Oh, Liz is a bright one. I paid for that law degree myself, thinking it'll probably turn her all fancy. But hell, Harry, she came back a firebrand socialist. Sometimes she scares me with her zeal. Wait, the girl by the whirling, who was keeping an eye on you, is he talking about her? Oh, and she also really likes gardening, I hear. In March? Strange. Anyway, let's move on. How do I know? Let me tell you about these people. That's their M.O. It's what they do. Last winter, some poor workers in Terminal E went on a little strike. The company sent in Sediment, a security contractor. The strike was over the workers' right to wear protective footwear, Harry. These guys turn up and start beating people. Tell you what, Harry, I wouldn't be surprised if we got the same mercenary company after a little rebranding. And I'm sure as hell not surprised to see an army of scabs under my gates. So you believe the scabs were organized by the security contractor? You said it. Hell, one of those guys looks big enough to take down that proverbial elephant. Boys like that don't just happen to show up during strikes. That does sound quite unlikely. Yes, the big guy leaving the scabs at the gate is colossal. Racist mugs in the trash and in the apartment? You guys are just light years ahead of me. I have so much confidence in the ability of your organization. I'm relieved you're doing this and leaving me to do what I do best. Helping people with the power of politics. Yes, yes. Do you think this weasel is somehow connected to the murder? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't cross paths like that. All I want is for you to succeed in your investigation. I would never complicate things for you. Oddly, it seems to be true. Believe me, Harry, he's a nobody. Just your basement variety nobody. Can't imagine him being connected to a high-caliber case like this. But he does live nearby. 
Maybe it's a pedantic weasel. Fascists are known to be neat freaks. I feel like a real detective right now, Harry. Am I getting this right? That's not how you pattern someone. The technique is way off. You strike with your whole body, not just the baton. Oh, Harry, thanks for the tip. I'll leave doing the real damage to you. You are the real police officer, after all, not me. Oh, they are simply fine young men, all seven of them. Exemplary union members, always working to advance their position in the local socialist democratic movement. Core members. Old Theo used to run them, but things really kicked into gear when Titus took the reins and named the group after himself. <laughs> Gotta love his initiative. Interesting. Who's second in command? They're almost all of them great guys, born leaders. Whatever happened, I'm sure they only had the best interests of Martin A's and Revachol in mind. Work with them. Hell, interview them. But don't fight them. They really are just like you. Men who like beer, women, and some order on the streets. But of course, it's the least I can do for my good friend Harry. I'll do it right after we've concluded this talk. You can now go and tell Titus about this. See what he has to say. Also, Harry, here's five real. The lieutenant watches you pocket the banknote. He looks a little puzzled. Good boy. A real team player. Now, do you have any more questions? So they shot him. He was shot in the head before he was hanged. How odd. I don't know what to say, Lieutenant. They told me they hanged him. A hanged man is what I saw when I took a look into that yard. It's impossible to say if he's telling the truth, sire. What I do know is, the case is in safe hands. If anyone can get to the bottom of this shot and hanged man, it's my two little policemen. Godspeed, policemen. Was it a good tour? I'm not sure we made much headway here. I was hoping we'd bust the case wide open. Heck, I even wanted to tell you what I really want to achieve with the strike. I don't know what happened, Harry. I wanted you to feel like Mr. Martin A's. And, of course, I also wanted you to find your gun. But it's like I can't completely trust you. Yet. Yes, Harry. It's like I can't fully trust you if you're not a man of the left. I want to, but I just can't. A man of the left, so you have to be a social democrat. He's been hurt too much in the past by men who aren't social democrats. Perfect, Harry. That's perfect. My version of the left is not against the companies. It's with the companies. Honestly, what I have in mind is a business proposal. A left-wing business proposal, but still... And what would this entail? Once again, I require nothing unethical or illegal of you. You just need to get two little signatures on this piece of paper and then mail it to my accountant in La Delta. It depends. I don't think what we just got from Mr. Clare was very useful. But, he thinks, it's your call. As I said, it weighs on me heavily. But once we get really talking, well, I'm going to hand you the keys to Martin A's and maybe even help you figure out who's behind this killing. He's saying as little as possible, as vaguely as he can, deliberately omitting things. I'm glad you asked, Harry. 
The Union is going to build a modern youth centre in Martinez. It will be righteous. We're going to get those teenagers off drugs and on roller skates. Roller skating, not drugs, Harry. You like this. There's a nameless little street on the coast with some old houses around it. Most people have already signed. I just need two more signatures to get this mission off the ground, Harry. On the coast, Harry, across the canal. There's a cul-de-sac there, a little village they're calling it. A gloomy place. You'll find it. I trust your detective skills, Harry. Water drips from the eaves. A woman looks at her freshly tarred skiff. There's a pair of cavalry boots under the fish in the box, and the wind howls like a vicious spirit. You're already pretty deep into this. What's a little more? No one can see you here in Martinez. They are just going to have to deal with the construction noise for six months, and then they'll be living like kings. Right next to a fancy new youth centre, designed by the best architects from Stella Marie. You bring joy to my heart, Harry. Such a pleasure to be working with you. Here. You need to get signatures from Isabel Sadie and Lillian Carter. The cul-de-sac is right past the pawn shop and across the canal. I hear there is some trouble with the water lock, but they should fix it by Wednesday morning. Once you have the signatures, mail this to 13022 La Roca in La Delta. Then I know we can do business together. Take the legal documents out of the envelope. A 12 to 40 month construction period and the zoning plan in the addendum. The youth center cuts into the ocean like the bow of some great modern ship. Apparently, it's going to cover most, if not all, of the street and the square between the existing houses. It's three stories tall. It's going to be awfully close to the already existing buildings, almost wall to wall, practically integrating them into the youth center. I'm no property lawyer, but it looks fine. I like the print side. They're not selling or leasing anything. It's not the perfect solution, but... There is no loophole. The simple truth is, the current residents are going to lose their street access and for the next 12 to 40 months, their lives will be dominated by constant construction noise right next door. Once the construction starts, it'll probably take a few months, a year maybe, for even the most stubborn occupants to get tired of living like this. After that, they'll sell their property for cheap and move out. I should have seen it. Everard probably has eyes on us, but we could try to get other people to sign this instead of those listed. Or you could forge their signatures yourself. By the time he finds out, we'll already be gone. However, we'll need access to the coast before we do anything. Everard won't believe you got villager signatures if you can't even get to the village. You can try a forgery as soon as we can cross the waterlock.
The note is written with a blue pencil on a piece of lined office paper. The kitchen magnets have left spots on its surface. Does it say anything interesting? This is tangential at best, but the lieutenant's detective instinct is still active. Someone has scribbled. S. I can't believe the off-site copy is still here. The illiterate ginger kid keeps stealing stuff from the studio, so I had to hide it somewhere safe. You'll find the filament memory with the off-site copy in the frozen ice cream maker. Please take it home, ASAP. It's important. I'd do it myself if I lived in a civilized place with a freezer. Take care, Suliswaf. Someone who owns a radio computer? My guess is as good as yours, officer. It belongs inside a radio computer, storing its memory. It's like a tape. You listen to disco tapes, right? It's like one of your disco tapes, only for a computer. It's like the production schedule you found. Only this one's an off-site copy. Really? You don't have a single guess? Oh, I'm sure that child would love to get his hands on the filament memory. Even if he doesn't know what to do with it, he'd probably try to pawn it for speed, based on our encounter. I don't know. I assume it's somewhere close to the ice bear fridge. Didn't you see one right next to the breaker box? It's just a racist mug. What's there to read here? Not much. Oh boy, here we go. What are you going to say about a broken, tossed away mug that you dug out of the garbage? If you want to earn some change by guilting people, go for it. But if you want to earn real dough, finish the case and start getting paid again. An intricate web of blue lines stretches across the torso of the hanged man from the right shoulder to the solar plexus. Each time the lines intersect, a small white star is formed in their crossing. Hundreds of fading asterisks riddle his skin. Their concentration is highest around his heart. The pattern still kind of has an ethnic feel to it, but nothing familiar. The bullet is safely sealed away in a plastic bag bearing the RCM stamp. Kim has filled out the label on the bag with the item number, case number, and date and location the bullet was found. What? Well, if I was the bullet, which I'm not, I would say find the weapon that shot me. If we find who owns it, we will have likely found who used it, possibly to kill our victim. In conclusion, the more we know about this bullet of yours, the better. The squashed bullet has some sharp edges where the jacket has split open. It feels cold, even through the bag. You wouldn't ordinarily have cause to handle jacketed bullets. The citizen's militia uses cast bullets only. Little pebbles of metal loaded from the muzzle, usually in a cartridge. The jacket of the bullet is made of a yellowish metal. It has blossomed out to reveal a dark gray core. The base of the bullet is close to five millimeters in diameter. You can just about make out a few strations near the base of the bullet. Little hairlines, linear. It feels standard. It's quite destroyed. Some of the fragments are still lodged in the wound. What can you say about the bullet so far?
A jacketed bullet. Okay. It would have been shot from a military-grade breech-loading rifle, not from a muzzle loader like those typically found on the streets of Martinez. Highly unusual. The people of Revachol haven't carried breech-loading weapons like this for nearly half a century. Even the RCM uses ordinary and jacketed conical bullets. This is strange. Very strange. I like this, officer. Strange means unique. Unique means incriminating. We need to find a gun that shot it. A rifle. Revolutionary period. Your bullet looks to be an old 4.46 millimeter from the surplus left over from the turn of the century. Probably an antique or a retrofitted antique. The 4.46 caliber was widely used with the Belmagrave rifle, a Revacholian manufacturer. The BM dominated the battlefields of the Insulindian theater of the anti-centennial revolution 50 years ago. Incidentally, you have just such a rifle with you, the dusty old thing you found hidden in the basement below the commercial area. It's unusable, sadly. If it were, the bullet would probably fit the chamber. No, but Zeliger, a major firearm manufacturer, ended up with a surplus after the war. So there are still a lot of these old military rifles floating around, usually broken. The quality was appalling. Antiques enthusiasts, guerrilla fighters in distant countries, a few lucky jamrock bangers. You're looking for the same thing you found in that hidden weapons cache, only in working order. Hmm. What are you thinking? Bullet? Okay. And? An antique. That makes sense. There can't be many breech-loading rifles floating around in Martinez, or anywhere in Ravachol, really. I have to hand it to the monarchs. It's quite admirable that they took the advice of criminologists last century and banned the use of breech-loaders in peacetime. Some new RCM recruits get impatient with their muzzle loaders once they've trained with military-grade weapons, but they realize it's worth it in the end. Prohibiting peacetime law enforcement to front-loaded rifles is a policy enforced by the Moralist International in all the nations of the Real Belt. Imagine if everyone, cops, citizens, had access to firearms that could shoot multiple rounds without pausing to reload. After the first shot, the second, third, and so on come much easier. But back to the investigation. Let's find out. Next step, finding the gun itself.
went native on the chief, huh? Those ballerina antics were reckless. Should have just punched him in the throat again. Wrong. You did the right thing with Measurehead. The ballerina antics won you the fight. Let's talk about our right to work. You here to fuck with us? Beat the honest worker down? Good. We're fighting for a cause here. Right to work! Right to work! Besides, we're not that different. It helps if people see us talking, cops and strike breakers together. Shows authorities are on our side. Builds confidence. Rights of people. Rights of workers. To have gainful employment. To make a salary. And feed their families. Maybe you should ask them the questions. Like, why we're not allowed to make a living here. Shame on you! We have families to feed, you piece of shit. So do we, Scott. We were promised work. We'd be in there, working, if the bastards hadn't shut the gates. Main gate's locked. Would take heavy ordnance to bust it open. I try to get in through the secretary's office. Door is locked. The guards blocking the way to the access panel. And I don't mean the scrawny mesk punk either. I mean head measurer, or whatever he is. Yeah, I saw your ballerina moves up there. <laughs> In a real fight, these acrobatics will get you killed faster than a bullet. You caught him off guard. That only happens once. Now he's alert, standing on a narrow bridge, and my men are tired and hungry. Why don't you go arrest them instead? I'm sure they've done plenty of criminal shit. They have that look. It would be better for the neighborhood if you went home, at least for now. If you can't get in anyway. No. They will give up eventually. Or get drunk. Leave the button unguarded. Then we charge. Honest men and women with rights to work, to be useful, not toys for corporate interests. We came here to help the harbor run smoothly in time of crisis. If Union fucks don't want work, they ought to let in those who do want work. I have a question. Why do all these men follow your leadership? You think they follow because I'm big and loud? No. They follow the rules of the market, the rules of the economy, because they were given a job to do. When a bunch of ungrateful, lazy cockroaches can't get their act together, decide to block honest work for other people. Beats me. They mumble nonsense about boardrooms and workers' rights, while we have the right to work when the man moves around you perceive some serious abs underneath his tight-fitting shirt this man is in shape there's something odd in the way he carries himself his set of clothing looks vaguely mismatched the different pieces of the attire seem ill-fitting his shirt is far too small and an unpleasantly tight fit, while the overalls, held up by a belt, seem to fit a man with much more corpulence. He ignores your question, choosing instead to turn to the emaciated workers, raising both fists in the air. The clothes are obviously not his. Silence is the answer. There's something off here. 
but he won't say what. You've been talking to him for quite a while now. Something is off with this guy. Ask him where he's from. What's it to you? Am I a suspect? Done no crimes. I only fight for the rights of people. We're all workers, right? Workers stick together. Came from the eminent domain in Jamrock. Backgrounds in odd jobs, heavy lifting, cargo hauling, bouncer work. I know the drill. A monstrous shadow high above the fire traps of the domain. The 881 motorway running over this district of Jamrock. Concrete pillars rise up from the midst of the dilapidated wooden houses on the horizon, barely visible, the hazy machinery of the harbor. Life in the domain is even worse off than in Martinez. The cold air is stiff from the fumes of the motor carriages and lorries roaring overhead. Below, broken down, battered people mill on the dusty streets with no purpose. Yet, amongst them, there is no sight of this man. Nowhere. Yeah? <laughs> what makes you say that? They know me. That's bullshit. A colorful display of cigarettes and alcohol bottles line the shop wall inviting you closer again i'm obliged to inform you that both alcohol and cigarettes damage your health here you go mister A small cabinet on the wall is filled with various medicine bottles, nasal sprays, and blister packs. Okay, here. I hope so. Everything's still cool here, officer.
everything still cool here, officer? Start with a little compliment, then work your way up from there. This is about business, remember. Oh, okay. But why, officer? An investment? What kind of investment? I hear you, officer. What kind of a sum are we talking about here? Sounds like a fair deal all around. Corruption. It's just like bus or seagull. A kid watching out of a window describing things going by. He doesn't like it too much, but what do you do? Keep coming back. That's good, officer. Keep browsing those clothes. Keep saving that economy. You find your hands deep in tattered and faded garments made from weird polyester blends that make your body itch and sweat in all the wrong places. The box smells like cat piss or like an old person with no money. Economical, but also trendy. Look first hand, buy second hand. Keep the economy moving. The speakers below are banged up and worthless. The sneakers triumph. The shine on these sunglasses lasts a lifetime, officer. 100% guarantee. A very large red t-shirt with an impressive print stands out from the other garb. Oh yeah, the print depicts a muscled man striding toward you. A giant sword in each hand, encircled by burning embers. Behind him is a cluster of cabins engulfed in flames. Beneath him are the words, Hyeomdal burning. The antlers on the hood of the man's cloak and his piercing blue eyes are familiar. It's the man from Hyundal. Walking away from his burning village, yes. The man from Yelmdow is the hero of a series of popular books based on a fictional version of Kotla, mostly what is nowadays Arda NFD. In fact, most people don't think that man from Yelmdow ever really existed, but they are wrong. Yelmdow isn't a real place. Neither is the man a real man, of course. But both the man and Hyomdal are an ontological necessity. But hey, it's not worth getting into an argument about. Wow, what? I mean, even if the man from Hyomdal didn't exist before the adventure novels, the stories have made it so that he has. It's simple, really. Okay. You sound skeptical. It's not that complicated. 
All that's required is a more robust understanding of cause and effect. Besides, I've been to Kotla, though not quite as far north as the Hjelmdal, and watched northern lights travel across the sky. Very unique energetic tides there. His theory isn't exactly incoherent, but its logic does suggest some unusual neural activity. Interesting. Stop talking about this nerd stuff. It will make you weedy. Buy the damn shirt already. It's powerful. Smells like worn cotton and a little old sweat there. Worn cotton with a side of flea market or trash bin. Sniffing is okay. But please don't try anything on. Can't have you leaving your photon emissions in the fabric of things you're not going to buy. Two real. That's dirt cheap. But why? I suppose that makes sense, yes. Please go ahead and take it. Welcome to Hjelmdal. A typical Martinez streetlight sits among assorted floor and table lamps. The light pole has been carefully cut, and the wiring has been redone and attached to a standard indoor plug. The light buzzes faintly, but persistently. This would make quite a statement in your living room. Yes, officer. As you see, it's in perfect working order. His manner is casual, but his speech is careful measured. He wants you to know that he has nothing to hide. It was brought to me to be altered. We are not here to investigate the theft of city property. You have to admit it's rather clever what he's done with it. Seven hundred real. A bargain, I dare say. A bargain? No, it's not. He's trying to sweet-talk you into buying trash. The light has undergone three transformations, and every transformation, large or small, has a price tag. Well, there are the cost of removal and rewiring. But the most important transformation is the light's placement among ordinary, indoor fixtures, which has adjusted its morphological field. The light became suitable for use inside the home just a few days ago. Okay, that checks out. The boom boxes on the shelf look well loved and well traveled. Chipped, dented, they stare at you with the unblinking eyes of their tape reels. One especially catches your eye. Deep gold and amber plastic with a big old handle on top. A classic boombox that says, Stereo 8 approved. 
Just make sure it works before you buy it. Is the Harman Walshi W2, made in Vespa, designed in Seoul, plays all reel-to-reel -reel format, 2mm, 8mm, 12mm, it's even got a little radio in there. It'll set you back 12 real. If police work means playing tapes, sure, you can use it for that. Or any other time you'd need to play a tape. Absolutely. I've tested each one myself with recordings of speech. Found sounds and music from a variety of genres. Even though... I don't really like music. And here you are. Quality sound reproduction on the go. It'll play anything. Wherever... Turn any tape into a conversation of sounds and shapes. You see rows of toy soldiers guarding the rest of the trinkets displayed on the table. Some on horseback, others in rags, others yet in bright blue uniforms. All are stern and unyielding in their duty. You see rows of toy soldiers guarding the red big men on big horses, clad in lamella armor and carrying flintlocks, the kind that would mow down a line of enemy soldiers in the blink of an eye. Franco-Nigerian knights. I used to be very serious about these guys. They're not all blue. These figurines also wear gold coats and caps, complemented by orange trousers. They are variously posed, wielding swords and rifles with bayonets. This is what the Loyalists looked like, yes, at first. Then they wised up and got camouflage. Which ones? Ah, those. Yes, they are. I find the paint job a bit gaudy, but children like the bright colors indiscriminately. This set of soldiers isn't meant to look impressive. A few have rifles, but most of them carry pistols. Some even shovels and tall sticks. You're probably talking about the revolutionaries, yes? Yes, they are soldiers, revolutionary soldiers. I think their poverty has been exaggerated for effect. When you place them next to the royalists, it doesn't seem like they could possibly win. Okay. I don't like either set too much, to be honest. Why? What's this? A headless man riding a horse. A headless man wearing futuristic tracksuit trousers that say found. Oh, that's the headless phone rider. The headless phone rider. It's an urban legend. About a man who rides the streets of Revachol sporting a fawn tracksuit. As you see, he's missing his head. Fifty cents. Bargain price. I'll throw in the tiny cap too. I think he's looking for it, or something. That part of the story has many interpretations. Did I mention that this figurine is supposed to be lucky? 
always carry it with you. Hello, hello. Let me know if I can help you with anything. Of course. It's in working order still, isn't it? Just pick your tape and set it spinning. It all starts with the tape. alive and well. Don't keep me waiting now. What's in there? In that dark sarcophagus. Yes, yes. How was it? Please do tell. Did anything survive? Have you located the entity? A novelty dice maker? Well, spit it out. Why does she need the dice? For some kind of sorcery? Sometimes they use the ankle bones of sheep. I don't understand. If it's not her, then where is the source of the doom? How did she explain the curse? The narrative she's built herself, it does need tearing down. She's squeezing on the pendant too tight, a drop of blood in her palm. order presence, yes. I've heard of these triactors. In certain occult literature, that's too dark to dwell on for too long, and definitely not in the presence of my daughter. I understand everything, sir. Thank you for your descending into the maelstrom. I will keep fort up here, strengthen the wards, do my best. And if you happen upon the third entity in your travels, May the Lord be with you. Well, this has been absolutely educational. If we happen on the third presence in our travels, we will certainly come back to tell you. Should we get out of here before the vortex collapses? The shop around you feels ancient suddenly, damp and saturated by the coastal air. The books are rotting. A great cold lives here and there. Two, 1,200 meters away on the urban coast. The dark shape of a church is reflected on the water, calling. A book about cockatoos? There should be one upstairs, right next to the shelf of biographies. A sulphur-crested cockatoo sits on the cover, its beak slightly open. It looks as if the bird is calling out the book title. From A to Zurich, 
a guide to a well-behaved cockatoo. Turns out that there are so many different cockatoo species, and they all have behavioral problems. You don't have behavioral problems. That's garbage. You're cool. It's a must-have if you own a cockatoo. I've heard they're quite capricious. This bookstore is not strictly about crime, romance, and biographies of famous people. There's also a wide range of paranatural literature. Amidst the various books, you find one written by someone named Matthias W. Dundas. It's about wholeness, unity, balance. These three things are very important to the working class mind. The point of the book, and many others on this shelf, is to give people medicinal advice in situations where they don't have access to paid health services. It serves platitudes, while also telling everyone that traditional medicine, the kind people don't have access to, and which costs more than this book, is garbage, and would only give you cancer anyway, without even curing your cold or anything. Wholeness, unity, balance, on the other hand, can basically take care of anything. Though it is important to note. When it's up to your mind to heal yourself, then it's because of your mind that you're ill in the first place. The book features chapters on topics such as how to find magnesium. It even lists plants you can harvest magnesium from. How to continue drinking if you're an alcoholic who has destroyed his liver. And there's even a chapter on the ancient Serais tradition of using duck gall bladder preservatives to treat and prevent sexually transmitted diseases. Pre and post factum apply. Nothing worth buying. Come, sir, please, no browsing in that shelf. That wisdom is not for free. I can't have you end up, like, opening a police store next door and stealing my customers. Oh, no. Several maps have been attacked. The maps look old and faded. Your eye... Yes? Yes? Because you're the best qualified. No, that doesn't seem right. If you're so well qualified, why can't you remember why you were sent? Anyway, don't keep the lieutenant waiting. Yes. Look at you. It's because you're a failure. They sent you to slight precinct 57. Just think about it for a second. You're a raging alcoholic who showed up three days late wearing piss stained disco garb. You weren't sent here to win. I've considered it. It would be immensely ugly of them, not to mention unprofessional, but I also think it's somewhat unlikely. I checked the records. This jurisdiction dispute, through Policies Martinez, reaches back to the 30s. It's as old as my station. 
And all this time, we can't decide who gets Martinez? I think, yes, both stations would prefer a win. I am the finest of nothing. Safe? No. But you are old. You've made it this far. Something has brought you through. We've only just started working together, so I don't know what it is yet. But it's there. So no, I don't think they sent you as a joke. And even if they did, they are in for a surprise. The plaque on the shelf reads, Biographies of Famous People. You see a large variety of names, none of which ring a bell. Browsing through all the books with all their names makes your head spin. None of these seem important or relevant. It's all just vapid egoism. Suddenly, a particularly odd title catches your eye. It reads, High Speed Love. The Tragic True Love Story of Jacob Irv and Alfie Delatraz by one Cecilia Averbrook. High Speed Love chronicles the romance between two of the finest tip-top tournay racers in history. One of them is the madcap driver, Jacob Irv. His blonde mane graces the cover. Next to Irv's life story, you see a slim biography of an Occidental rock star called the Anti-Star. He's famous for shooting morphine into one of his eyeballs and cocaine into the other. Next to that, River Sholian radio personality Guillaume Bevy stands in front of a rundown drug den. He's a permanent fixture on Channel 8 reporting on real-life crime and ruining cops' days. I really must insist you buy one of the books. Reading them is not for free. Do still browse, though, but not too long. I'm sorry, I did not mean to rush you. You are browsing. Go ahead. Take your time. Time is commerce. I would say... Mm, the Greatest Innocence. Yes, most certainly. It's an important educational tool delving into the depths of history, religion, and their relation to innocentic power. A very influential historical figure, but surely I don't have to tell you that. You're a law officer, and law officers have at least some education. The book is also very daring. The author aims to re-examine the universal understandings of the innocentic system creating a fresh vantage point and a shift in the tired order of things. Perhaps for a layman, deep analysis is necessary to peel back the multi-layered meanings. Do her words seem vague and abstract to you? Certainly, it's prudent for a person to have at least an elementary understanding of history and society. Imagine the chaos we'd be in otherwise. You feel like you should get this one. Definitely. It's important somehow. There's something personal inside. These shelves are overburdened with books from the same series. You see the name Dick Mullen over and over. A couple of spook novels hide amidst all the detective books. Thrilling tales of spycraft and daring do. Oh, crime robberies, murders, even sexual crimes. We're fortunate to have Dick Mullen and his stories to sort all that out. You're a, a police officer, apparently. You should buy all of these. They really do teach a person how to be a proper detective. Crime fiction is a disgrace. An asinine misrepresentation of the physical attributes of the arduous everyday work of actual police officers. These books greatly overstate the excitement of police work 
glossing over how long it takes to actually follow up on leads and eliminate dead ends. What's more, they completely ignore the psychological hardships of year after year coming into contact with people during the worst days of their lives. Not a single mention of all the stress this work creates upon the officer's family. Detective fiction just doesn't tell the truth at all. Now, would you like a list of all the books found on the shelf? You see, Dick Mullen on the job. Get me Mullen. The stalwart adventures of Richard P. Mullen. Dick Mullen and the murder in the orchard. The sordid affair of Dick Mullen. A killing is declared. Dick Mullen in the murder house. The final case of Dick Mullen. An obvious lie. Dick Mullen in the clock tower. The ordeals of Dick Mullen. Dauntless Dick. Dick Mullen's funeral pyre. The murder of Dick Mullen. Oh no, turns out he faked it to solve a case. Yes, there's also the dame who did it. Farewell, my Mullen. Faking death seems to be a common trope in the Mullen series. The morbid tales of Dick Mullen. A dark tide turns. Tragedy calls for Dick Mullen. Another one with fake death. And, of course, Dick Mullen, the murderer. In order to catch a murderer, Dick Mullen must become the murderer. After all this, you still haven't found the answer to the one question that matters. Who is Dick Mullen? Your quick eye notices a small caterpillar crawling across the spine of a book. The title reads, Dick Mullen and the Mistaken Identity. A worn paperback from Dick Mullen's classic hard-boiled phase. The premise seems to be that Dick Mullen is framed for the murder of his best friend and has just a few days to prove his innocence. Could it be the motifs of unstable identities and shocking betrayals? Then this is the book for you. A small mountain of colorful board game boxes. There are numerous types of games for all ages. A lot of shelf space seems to be taken up by Wirral related merchandise. An endless variety of source books, lore books, and codices litter the table. The topmost book is titled Welkin Compendium, Second Edition. There's also a large hardbound tome with intricate cover art, The Hunters of Catawack. Boreal Creature Compendium, and a Pick Your Path adventure game book titled Tales of Wirral, Cavern of Velcrag. Books in a board game section? Who wants to read books? There's a box that says Wirral, third edition mega setting supplements module. The side panel notes a fantastic adventure board game new maps and miniatures. A sticker on it displays 25 real. That price is steep, but then it's the third edition mega set in supplement, so it makes sense. Nonsense for anemic beano clouds. Wonderful board games, sir. The Viticulturist is a classic for sure, or perhaps you'd like Archipelagos of Incylinder. A very educational game for those interested in geography. Browbritta is a fun game of economic competition, but can get quite intense after a while. We have games for the whole family. You can play with your children. Then you're a 
lucky man, officer. Children are the greatest of treasures. For playing with friends, I'd recommend Suzerainity. It's a civilization building game where you build a civilization, then set off to brutally colonize and repress other civilizations. It'll cost 12 real. Lousy auras there. No, role playing games are popular among those types. You know, who are into those kind of things. Personally, I don't like it. Not at all. I've heard they turn people into occult enthusiasts. That they have rituals where they try to summon entities. Highly immoral stuff. You can still buy them though. I'm sorry, sir. I can't talk right now. I'm very busy with my homework. I have so much homework now. You just can't win. Out of the rain and into the gutter. Math. It's really difficult. Like, really. They say you need it to get rich. Better than standing outside in the cold, I guess. Oh, oh, I found something while you were away. I thought this would fit you. Like, thanks for helping out. Not me. The city, I mean. Like a detective does. Yes, I bet it looks good on you. Really serious. Right, I have to get back to my homework now. Before Mum notices. Man, this is hard. The display rack is brimming with worn paperbacks featuring an extremely muscular, sword-wielding barbarian on the cover. Nearly all the titles contain the word Hyamdal somewhere. This is entirely, completely you. You have found the right books. Mountains of it. Heroic quantities of Hyamdal. Roy's puny shirt is nothing compared to the real deal. Rows and rows of Hyamdalamen blur your vision. You make out some titles. Man from Hyamdal and the Mammoth Riders. Man from Hyamdal, Return to Hyamdal. And the Solipsistic, Man from Hyamdal and the Hyamdal Man. Maybe a hundred? Man from Hyamdal and the sages at the end of the world. Man from Hyamdal and the false god. Man from Hyamdal and the scorched earth. Man from Hyamdal, the Hyamdal colonies. Man from Hyamdal and the swamp beast. Man from Hyamdal and the snow crabs. Those snow crabs are worse than they sound. Not even close. Man from Hyomdal in hell. Man from Hyomdal and the forest of slaves. Man from Hyomdal under the lake. Man from Hyomdal, Hyomdal burning. There's even the trial of death, a pastoral combat game book set in the world of Hyomdal man, and so much more. The display rack. This is entirely, completely you. You have found a twinge at the back of your head makes you flinch. Your eye starts twitching. Your hand reaches toward a book with glossy cover art of the very muscular man from Hyamdal in chains, kneeling in front of a staircase leading to a throne. A woman sits on the throne, leering at the man. Between the throne and the Hyamdala man lies a bonfire, casting shadows on the wall. 
The shadow of the woman's headdress looks like a pair of devil horns. The title reads, Man from Hyomdal and the Devil Woman. The entire series is also endearingly racist, if I may add. Oh, sirs, I know. This really isn't representative of our values. But the store has to cater to its customers. The display rack before you is burdened under piles of Man from Hyomdal novels. A sulfur-crested cockatoo sits on the cover. Its beak slightly open. It looks as if the bird is calling out the book title. From A to Zurich. A sulfur-crested cockatoo sits on the cover. Its beak slightly open. It looks as if the bird is calling out. Slowly, you move your hand toward... <clears throat> do we really need to do this? I think not. A sulfur-crested cockatoo sits on the cover. It's, you wait for the storekeeper to be distracted. When she's not looking, you haul the tome of cockatoos. In. It's quite a challenge, but eventually, the guide to the cockatoos is yours. This door has been closed with a padlock. A chalk-drawn number on the board's no reply. It's a solid lump of metal, but the shackle is deeply corroded. A solid pair of chain cutters would make short work of it. Better whip out those cutters. You won't get very far otherwise. This door has been closed with a padlock. A chalk drawn. The shackle snaps like a twig, and the lock falls to the floor with a little thud. It should be possible to enter now. After you, detective. Thank you. 
Master Investigator, you just can't keep yourself away from locked and hidden places, can you? Nothing, nothing. You're right. Get in there. Deep. Invade every personal space. Break every lock. Attaboy, the world's secrets were made for you. They wait patiently for you to uncover them. The plaster cast bust depicts a middle-aged man with impressive sideburns. The name on the plinth reads, Kras Marzov. Honestly, he does kind of look like you after all. I suspect that's exactly what they are trying to do. There aren't many communists around, not after the revolution. Some youth still keep the ideology going, it seems. The White Star, the photos on the wall. I think we have broken into the apartment of a young communard. How fitting. Hold on a second. Is this why you broke in here? To find out whether you're Krasmazov? Sure you are. Well, you both do seem to share an affinity for sideburns, but it seems like old Kras here didn't drink nearly as much as you. Ah, <sighs> very well. Let's look for identifying features then. Doesn't he have a birthmark right here? What about you? Alright, but here's the big thing. Krasmasov looks Samaran, and you don't. Yes, he does. Look at his eyes. Wasn't his mother a Samaran immigrant? Good, so you're not him. It's decided. You are not the most famous philosopher of the modern period. You hear someone walking around inside, rearranging the furniture. The number on the panel says 10. The walking stops abruptly, but no one comes to the door. Sounded like a woman. A woman's shoes. A poor communard, from the looks of it. The room is barely bigger than a closet. Do I have to open the door? Do you have a warrant? I'm not obligated to open the door if you don't have a warrant. Let's go. We don't have a reason to get inside that apartment. Later then, entering this door seems a physical challenge. It's generally easier to do things if you have literally any reason. Give me a moment.
The cold never does any good for my bronchitis. <laughs> I'm fine. Fine. Don't you worry about me. <laughs> now, what do you want from me, policeman? She's the cleaning lady. She knows the floor plan and the residents. I'm no one. Just an old woman who cleans these hallways. If you can call it living. I have a little room upstairs right next to the coal room. It's barely bigger than a closet. But I don't complain, no. I have my bed and my aching bones to keep me company. And that's all I need from this world. And all she gets, too. The coastal wind beats down hard on the coal room door, outside. Splashes of waves make the balcony slippery. She hasn't spoken to anyone for a while. Even her sentences feel rusty. Yes, yes. I know who you mean. The scrawny boy who's always smoking like the devil, right? Somewhere in the building, a child starts crying. You hear a radio tuned to a talk show and someone taking a shower. What's he in trouble for? Talk? What was so funny about that? He lives upstairs in room 28. Go to the balcony. It's one of those doors there. He's usually home in the evening. Thank you. We should go check out his apartment on the balcony. See if he's home. Ask away, policeman. I don't want to talk about Dewitas. Addicts, all of them. And sometimes I hear them screaming. They don't like me cleaning behind their door. Think I'm listening on their fights. So she doesn't. Not after that one time. There's a that one time here. We saw unpaid utility bills. Aren't they going to be evicted? No one likes them in this building. It's only because of the kids they haven't been thrown out. I don't like talking about those people. No one lives there. It's been empty for months. Impossible. I would know if someone had moved in there. Maybe it's those countercultural people again. Breaking into a house like it's a public space. You're a policeman. Be good and take a look, will you? Great. Young people. They're worse than rats. You know, always littering the hallways with trinkets and empty beer cans. Oh, that one is a scientist, a future scholar. I think he studies astrology at the community college. Education's good. I always tell them to study. Something to do with all those stars around his door. He asked me to leave his drawings up on the wall. A symbol of what now?
Economy? Why should anyone care about economy? People come and go. I don't keep an eye on everyone. They probably just moved or died. Hopefully somewhere else. The artiste? Nothing I can do about her, I'm afraid. She ruins the walls faster than I can clean them. Still, she leaves an old lady to her business. More than I can say for others. She mumbles some kind of a response, then hacks something into her handkerchief. You hear someone walking around inside. Excuse me? Of course not. Scare them. Suspected of some big crime. You have plenty of reason to enter. Oh, come on! Well, that was easy. That was smart. Satisfied? My name is Marielle Charpentier and I'm an agent with Martinez Realty Associates. I am not breaking in as I have every right to be here. The keys, see? Boy, there are a lot of different keys there. More than 20 at least. Do you want to see my ID as well? You can't legally ask for it, but why not? Want to see my residence permit too? It feels flimsy in hand, with the words Revachol Zone of Control, written under a nondescript municipal logo. There's a picture of her with shorter hair inside, along with all her personal details. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I need to be back in Midtown in an hour. I need to get it ready for the next lease, but as you can see, the previous tenant completely trashed the place. It was some kind of a moribund old man who used to be a business owner. You'd think they'd make rent. A sudden serious look crosses her face. This story didn't have a happy ending. But that was months ago. Anyway, was there anything you wanted or is that it? I'm in a hurry. Oh, that's another huge mess. The former tenant owes us three months of rent. Three. We closed the apartment and planned on auctioning off the valuables, but... And again, I have no idea how stupid mistakes like this can even happen. But Ron, when he came to close the door, didn't close the neighboring door. And there's a hole in the wall. A hole in the wall. Can you believe it? And then the tenant ran off with his stuff. He's gone. The money's gone. Just like that. The sum must have been puny.
these apartments are perfectly fine. They have gorgeous architecture, a million real view of the bay, good ventilation, neighbors, life, spark, and they are affordable. I'll tell you, Martinez has a future. In a few years, it's going to blossom with artists and creatives and those radio computer wizards. Well, it does not disappear from my hands. No, I don't let it. Don't ask me what happened with the wall. I have no idea how we're going to find the time or resources to fix it. Both apartments are now unrentable. Both. Of course. Give me a moment. I see. I hope some good people are finally going to move in. This place needs them. Oh, I do like wizards, and people like that in general. They have a lot to tell us about our fates. She means clairvoyance. shift in temperature the air chills around you dust settles on the stony floor a former architect stands before a slice of window a room plan in her hand a cold wave has made the air in the building stand still and frozen with temperatures falling down to minus 20 degrees celsius is red from the cold. She's breathing on her fingers, clasping the plan. Traces of sadness are visible in her expression. Faint pencil lines on paper depict the same place, but a missing eastern wall connects the room with the neighboring apartment. Ideas for arranging the furniture have been jotted down. It's clean and empty, with new tapestry embellishing the walls. A standard HB graphite pencil has fallen off a three-legged stool in the middle of the room. She had an eye for beauty. That isn't just a five-pointed star. It's an inverted white pentagram cradled in a wreath of antlers. The iconography of communism, in other words. 
The Star and Antlers was developed in the sixth decade of the last century and quickly adopted by Mezov and the Communards during the revolution. Even today, half a century after, the Star and Antlers retains the ability to evoke hope, disappointment and fear in equal measure. To symbolize the toppling of the old order. Also, some social democrats were already using it. The wreath of antlers represents a natural crown. It was about building a society that could exist in accord with the natural world and at the same time above it. Because white is the color of peace. Smug superiority, aesthetic musings, the triumph of capital is undeniable. But maybe the guns were sort of cool. Revolutionaries had loads of guns. Whatever kid drew this graffiti will get it one day. You just can't beat freedom and hustle jiggling all the time. Agent alcoholic. This door is made of metal and appears to be reinforced. Someone here really values their security. Number 28. This is where the cleaning lady said the smoker on the balcony lives. Let's see if anyone's home. Knock on the door. No one answers. Looks like the young man we are looking for isn't home. I think our best chance to catch him is in the evening. We should return tonight after we have finished with our day's work. How about 9 p.m.? Sound good? Tonight at 9 p.m., right here, apartment number 28. Good, let's go.
the piggies have learned how to saunter up staircases. I didn't think you could do that with hooves. But here you are. Yeah, you got me now. The dynamic between us has completely changed. That smell coming from her paint bucket. It's not paint. It's heavy fuel oil. Red dyed heavy fuel oil intended for exclusive use in government vehicles, to be precise. What did you think I was using? Aquarelles? Sucked it out of a cop's fuel tank myself. Back in Jamrock. Oh, what? You'll push me off this ledge and pry the bucket from my dead hands? Just an ordinary war. Nothing to see here.
afternoon sun shimmers off the white on blue police livery of the motor carriage. Do something important? Something murder related? There's always something important. Doesn't mean you can't take a moment to admire this piece of machinery. This is a Caprice Kanema, the Caprice Motor Corps follow up to their highly successful workhorse, Caprice 40, and the answer to the Lums racing breed, Ferv series. With its air cooled, rear mounted 12 cylinder compression ignition engine driving the rear wheels through a four speed manual gearbox, the Kanema is able to reach 100 kilometers per hour in 13.5 seconds and go on to a top speed of 180 kilometers an hour. The high center of balance is offset by a large battery bank mounted at the bottom of the cabin, feeding all the auxiliary systems and making the Kanema effectively a mobile power plant. Due to a quite steep price tag, it is very unusual to see one in police livery. Mm -hmm. You want to take a closer look? 130. I reckon that's a 7 litre V12 there. Seven point two supercharged. Yes, an extraordinary machine. It's nice and all, but why so modest? Put some zing into it, flare it up, slam it down. Helium headlights would improve the range and quality of the visual field a lot. Actually, I have a pair at home. Just haven't gotten around to fitting them yet. I need to lay some wiring for the ballast first. Maybe. Yes, definitely maybe. And means no 